Production funding for Homework Hotline is provided by New York State United Teachers. Working to educate and assist students, provide medical care and support, and strengthen local communities. NYSEC, working for communities across New York State. Hey now, let's take a moment So we all can figure it out What it's all about It's the Homework Hotline The Homework Hotline The Homework Hotline The Homework Hotline Welcome to Homework Hotline, I'm Craig Zaramba. And I'm Donna Minio. Homework Hotline is the place where you can get the tools you need to succeed both in and out of the classroom. For more information on Homework Hotline, go to our website, homeworkhotline.org. Here you can find games, other online resources, and the latest episode of our show. And don't forget, we want to hear from you on this topic. If you were the governor of your state, how would you spend a budget surplus? You can weigh in on this question and tell us what you think by visiting us on Facebook and leaving us a message, tweeting us by using the hashtag HHVoiceIt, or by visiting us on our website, homeworkhotline.org, and clicking on the Voice It button. Remember, the most thought-provoking responses will be put on air. The answers will be shared on tomorrow's Homework Hotline. We also want to remind our viewers that a little later in the show, Tim Cawley from the Rochester Museum and Science Center will be here with a Russian tortoise. And now, let's get to tonight's creature teaser. <laughs> this creature lives in the water and is found primarily in lakes and rivers that feed into the Pacific Ocean. It is born in freshwater lakes, then after a couple years swims to the Pacific Ocean. It spends the next couple of years in the ocean eating zooplankton, such as krill. This creature then swims upstream back to its lake to reproduce. This animal only reproduces in cold, clean waters, so its presence in a lake means that the water system is healthy. The name of this creature comes from an indigenous British Columbian word meaning red fish. This creature is actually blue on top during its trip out to the Pacific Ocean and turns red with a green head when returning home to the lake where it was born. Now, if you think you can solve the creature teaser, give our hotline a call at 1-866-264-5904 or just answer it on our website, homeworkhotline.org. Answer correctly and you could have a chance to share the answer at the end of the show. Every correct response will be added to our Hotline Hall of Fame. Earn enough points and you could win a tablet at the end of the season. Cool. All right, all this week on Homework Hotline, we are going to help Jamal with his holiday wrapping. Today, we are going to take a closer look at how much paper he needs for his gifts. All right, I've been working with Jam on Jamal yesterday yes. and I'm working on, on wrapping his presents. Cool. We've got four of them wrapped here. All right. And we've got three more to go and we've got right. some helpers to all help right, us. Cool. Let's go over to the table. Let's go. Hi, girls, how are you? Or elves or whatever you're gonna be? <laughs> Good. You're gonna do some wrapping for us, huh? All okay, right. well what you guys have is you have a cylinder and there's a bigger cylinder over there. There's a cube, okay, it's three dimensional, same size all the way around. And you have a rectangular prism or as we, those of us who buy gifts know it as a shirt box. Right. All right, so your chore while I'm doing my lesson is to figure out how to wrap these and not have a lot of waste. All right. Okay. All right, good luck. All right, here we go. Jamal has wrapped four of the seven gifts which are over on the other table. He has bought only one roll of wrapping paper that had 25 square feet available. He used some of it uh, last year, so he is not sure that he has enough paper left to wrap the three gifts left. So he unrolled the wrapping paper and measured how much was left, and he found that he had 10 square feet left. So now let's take a look. If you take a look at square feet, all of those things over there, all of these that I've done over here are measured in inches. So we really need to um, convert square feet into inches. So we're gonna take the 25 square feet and we're going to change it into inches. So if we take a look, 
what we need to remember is that one foot is equal to 12 inches. Now when you're talking about square, that means a one foot square is a one by one foot, and I'm just gonna put FT here. So this would give me one foot of wrapping paper. However, for inches, this is 12 inches, and this is 12 inches, so 12 times 12 isn't one. One square foot, I'm sorry, I forgot my square here, one square foot is actually 12 times 12, and that's one of those perfect squares that my seventh graders were told to memorize, and 12 times 12 is 144 square inches. So now, if I have 25 square feet, and I know that one square foot is 144 inches, all I have to do is take the number of square feet I have, we're gonna take the 25, and we're gonna multiply it by 144, and we can do that over here on the calculator. And we get 3,600 square inches. All right, so that's how much square inches was on that wrapping paper to begin with. So now let's take a look. I took um, my cylinder and I actually said, let's look at how do we find surface area? Because really when you're wrapping a present, you're really using surface area. A lot of us take our present and we, okay, we put it on the paper and then we roll it and we roll it some more and we roll it just to make sure it keeps covering. Well, what you're doing is a physical form of surface area without actually using the numbers. So what we're gonna do here is we're actually gonna do the cylinder that I did, this one over here, this nice paper here, we're gonna see what the square inches are on this. So, let's go down here. Now, because it's circular, we have to use pi in our answer. Typically, if you're in, your, in my classroom, I tell you to just leave pi, but because I want some numbers that I can work with, I'm actually gonna use 3.14 for pi. So pi is equal to 3.14. It's approximately equal. I shouldn't really say it's equal, it's a rounding. So now, if we look at my numbers, Always substitute into your formula your numbers. So now I have 2, 3.14. My radius, uh-oh, I have diameter. And a diameter, how do I figure out radius? Well, remember, the diameter goes all the way across. A radius only goes halfway across. So if we take this number, 6.5, and we divide it by two, we'll have our radius. So let's do that. And, oops, let me give myself, I don't see my full calculator. Divide it by two, and you're gonna get, oops, so 6.5 divided by two is equal to 3.25. So now we're gonna plug in 3.25 and I need my height. Oh, that's easy, it's right there. That's 7.5. Now I'm gonna wrap it down here and I'm gonna put in, again, my two, my 3.14 and now I need my radius but I'm gonna square it. All right, so now, all you gotta do really is use your calculator to get the answer, so let's try that. We have two times 3.14 times 3.25 times again 7.5. Then we're gonna add to that two times 3.14 times 3.25 equals. So that was 1,582 point, and I'm gonna round it two decimal places because I don't ever talk beyond the two decimal places usually. So 0.54 square inches, all right? So now let's take a look. 
I found out the dimensions of the gifts they're wrapping over there. And the dimensions, the cylinder, remember that's the one that's the round one, the hardest one to wrap. The diameter was five. So remember our radius has to be half of that or 2.5. And then you had a height of six. So the total surface area for that particular cylinder was 133.45. The shirt box or the rectangular prism was 17 by 10 and a half by 2 and a half, and the total surface area was 494.5 inches squared again. And the cube, all the sides were six. So that total surface area was 216 square inches. When you wrap and when you add all that up, you have 872.95 square inches that they needed left. And if we think about it, there was 10 square feet left. So if we take that and we multiply that by 144, that's going to give us 1440 square inches. So they have enough. They have enough. So let's go over and see how they did. All right, how did we do over here? Oh, wow, look at the ribbons. I love it. Okay, what did you find? I had a lot of extra. Okay, you had a lot of extra. Yeah. Why do you think that was? Um, because there wasn't as much surface area on the cylinder to cover as the other shapes. Okay, cool. good. How about the cube and the rectangular prism? Uh, I had a little bit extra, not too much, but I a little had a trouble trying to make it so it was tight enough. And there's uh, a little, little layer in there. That's okay. <laughs> I had the same issue. I was able to wrap it just fine, uh, but there is still a little bit of the air, but that's okay. We don't want them to guess what they're getting anyways, Makes right? Makes it easier to open right. it. Right. All right, Craig, as supervisor, how'd they do? It was good. Um, struggled the worst hit this end and the best down at that end. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, ladies, thank you so much. And Jamal thanks you because now you've wrapped his, pay his presents for him. Thank oh, you very God. much. And now we're going to get right to back and um, talk with Tim. So hang on for a minute. Greece is the most southern country in Europe and has the longest coastline. Greece has become well known for its thousands of islands that are spread throughout the Aegean Sea to its east, the Mediterranean Sea to its south, and the Ionian Sea to the west. Many people around the world are attracted to the history and beauty that Greece offers. Greece was the home of the first Olympic Games. The first games were held in 700 BC to honor the king of gods, Zeus. Such events like sprinting, long jumps, discus, javelin, wrestling, and the chariot racing took place. Romans banned the games in 393 AD, but they started again in Athens in 1896. Ancient Greeks also believed that Mount Olympus, the tallest mountain in Greece, was home to their gods. Mount Olympus later became the first national park in Greece. Today, there are more than 3.7 million people living in Greece's largest city, Athens. The people of Greece are well known around the world for their healthy lifestyle and diet full of olives, seafood, olive oil, and fresh produce. And now we'd like to welcome Tim from the Rochester Museum and Science Center to the show. Hi, Tim. Hey, gang. How are you doing? Tim. Good to Good. see you again. And Tim, what did you bring us today? We brought you Portis. Portis? Portis the tortoise. He's right. a Russian tortoise. <laughs> okay. Now, it's not our name. It was donated to the museum. Okay. And the little boy that owned him named him Portis, so we didn't want to confuse him. We just kept the name. Oh, Would he really nice. be confused? <laughs> well, he'd get over pretty quickly. Right. So what's the difference between a tortoise and a turtle? A tortoise will spend most of its life outside of the water on land, okay. whereas a turtle will stay inside. And this one, actually, this guy is a little bit different than all the other tortoises and turtles in that one of his names also is a four-toed tortoise. Ah. And most tortoises and turtles have five toes, so he's even more unique. Cool. Oh, wow. No. Where can this animal be found in the wild, and what type of climate do they live in? Well, he's a Russian tortoise, so... <laughs> Russia? Russia? Well, actually, Scandinavia, okay. oh. Denmark. No, okay. just kidding. <clears throat> he's in, actually, the southeast part of Russia. You'll find him in Pakistan, Iran, and Afghanistan, mostly in arid and up in rocky mountain areas, over 5,000 feet usually is where okay. he likes to hang out. Oh. He likes to be in arid climates. 
but he's not really keen on the heat. Once it gets over 80, 85 degrees, he starts to dislike it, so that, and then he'll go and he'll hide away. Cool. And, uh, but he'll also live around streams. He, you have to keep his substrate pretty dry because that's better for his shell and his skin, oh, okay. but okay. he still needs to get to where vegetation is and water. All right, cool. Um, is uh, the tortoise able to burrow? Actually, they burrow very well, cool. but he has to burrow in the springtime because that's when the rains have made it pretty soft. Right. He'll go down probably a foot or two, and they'll do two or three, four feet long, and then they'll have a big area where he can turn around kind of like his own private cul-de-sac. Sure. So he'll hang out and burrow, but they actually share burrows every once in a while. He'll go across and go into somebody else's burrow and they'll go, oh, well, thought well, it was home. <laughs> well, sorry, sorry, but I'm just gonna hang out for a little bit. Right. And uh, actually when they hibernate, they can go down as deep as six feet, two meters or so, six wow. feet, oh, wow. just to get away from the cold. All right now, is he full grown or will they? He's pretty close to full okay, grown. Okay, so that's about how long, the, large they get. Like a yeah, pocket. Just about five inches. The males will be five or six inches. The females maybe just a little bit longer, but he's pretty much so. He's pretty full grown, although it's hard to tell. They live like forty years. Wow. So it's that's a long kind time. of a it guess. Is. So do these guys have any predators? Actually, they do, especially when they're younger. Mm. When they're younger, their shells are a little softer, sure, and they're vulnerable. juveniles, they'll, they'll be picked up by ravens or foxes, oh. or you can get even, and depends on the, the lizards that are around in the arid climate, okay. and of course, coyotes and things like that, but their biggest problem actually is just man, uh -huh. because they're losing so much of their sure. habitat. So that's where We've they seen that with they other run things that you guys have exactly in as well. most animals yep. will have that problem. Cool. Now, Tim, we'd like to thank you for coming in. Oh, sure. And um, if you would like to learn more about the Rochester Museum and Science Center and see other videos about animals, visit our website, homeworkhotline.org. And now, stay right there. We'll be back in a se second. Bye, Portis. Newton's first law of motion states that an object at rest tends to stay at rest and an object in motion tends to stay in motion with the same direction and speed unless interfered with. All right, Craig, before you do your lesson, I'd yes. like to just um, reiterate to the viewers that I was at the end there, I yes. took 10 square feet yes. and I labeled it as square feet, yes. but then I multiplied it in the same line with the 144. I should have at that point erased the square feet because uh, what I was doing was creating it to square inches. inches right. So just so I don't confuse everybody, that 10 square feet times the 144, the bottom number, the 1440, is actually square inches. So I hope that didn't confuse anybody. Anyone. Good to know. Thank well, you. Well, I'm going to continue with uh, Jamal and help him determine the difference between uh, surface area and uh, two-dimensional, three-dimensional stuff. So that sounds great. To the board. All right, so Jamal's been rapping, and I have a real hard time, as you saw with some of our helpers tonight, they have a hard time rapping too, and that's all right though, because you can always, like some places, you can actually take it to the service counter or something, they'll wrap it for you, so just keep that in mind. And bags are good too, even though people don't really like the gift bags. So Jamal has been wrapping some gifts in boxes. So let's help Jamal by taking a look at the difference between a two-dimensional and a three-dimensional object. So when we look at the surface area of a two-dimensional object, we're looking at just the area of an object, like a sheet of paper. It really has, there is some thickness to it, but very small amount. So if we look at this object right here, we have the length times the width, and that's what area is. And when we do this, we get a total of 20 centimeters. Now a lot of students are going to say, well that's my answer. Well you got to include the square unit. So you got to either say centimeters to the second power, because when you multiply, um, five centimeters times four centimeters, you're actually multiplying the centimeters as well. So you do the five and the four gives you the 20, but then you multiply centimeters to the first power and centimeters to the first power, which gives you the centimeters squared, which is surface area, okay? And one of the things I was gonna show is as you plot the surface area, it's an actual linear thing. So if we looked at um, the length and the width of an object, if we did uh, four, three, 
the length and the width, uh, we would get uh, 5 and 4. If we did 5 and 4, we get here. Now, if we continue on, let's say we doubled both of these, all right? And so instead of being 5 centimeters, we would say, let's say it's 10 centimeters. And if we doubled this, we'd get 8 centimeters. If we did the surface area, we would have 80 centimeters. And if we come along here, if we did uh, 10 and and 10 and 8, um, it's actually a linear function. So, and why I say that is because um, Jamal's going to high school, and and some of the things they're talking about is the surface area of a cell and why they'd have to be really, really small. And as you increase that, we'll be talking about that in just a second. So now if we look at the surface dimension of a three-dimensional object. Now remember, three-dimension is the length times the width of an object times the height. So I have the surface area of a cube. And I use a cube because it's really easy. All the sides are the same. So if I do the length, or the, the and we're going to do the, the length, and we're going to do the surface area, all right? So if we do the length and the surface area, and if we do one centimeter times one centimeter, times one centimeter, a lot of people are going to say, well, the surface area is one centimeter, all right? And again, you got to include the, the cubic unit because you're multiplying centimeters times centimeters times centimeters, and we're talking about a volume, all right? Cubic surface area here, all right? So if we did one and one, uh, we'd get an area of right there, all right? And let's say we double this. So now instead of being one, we're going to go cross these off, and let's make two. Now I can write the length as two, and because it's a, the, a cube, they're all the same, so it's two centimeters here, and then the height would be two centimeters, all right? And if we multiply two times two is four, times two gives us eight, and again, you have to include your units, which is going to be centimeters cubed to the third power. All right, so if we did two, now we go here and my surface area is going to be eight, um, down right here. All right, um, the length times the width times height, two times two is four, times two would be eight centimeters cubed, okay. Oh, surface area, ah, so I'm, I'm doing, confusing myself here, surface area and volume, and I don't want to do. So, I didn't even read my equation here. It's the length times the width times the number of the sides. So we got to go back here and erase a little bit here and talk a little second about my mistake. All right. So one of the things that we always tell you guys, and you can see I didn't do that, is to got to read the equation. So if we go back and look at the surface area of a cube, it's one times one. That's the, the length and the width. And then I have to talk about how many sides. And I know I have one here. And if I draw the, um, a cube, there's other sides. So I have a bottom, I have a front, a side, a side, a top, a bottom, and a back. So I actually have six sides, okay? So if I do the length, which is one centimeter times one centimeter, and I count how many sides I have, it's times six sides. So one times one is one, times six is going to give me Again, it's going to be six, and some people are going to say, well, that's my answer. And again, you got to include my units. Now, because I'm not talking volume, I'm actually talking surface area, it's centimeters times centimeters is going to give me centimeters squared. All right? So now, how, you got to remember, and I did the same thing right there. I looked at, I thought I was talking about volume, and it's actually surface area. So make sure you read the question, and I hope that helps you guys out. Thanks a lot. King Philip came over for great spaghetti is a silly way to remember the classification of animals and plants in science. The classification order is kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. We have a winner in tonight's Creature Teaser. I believe it's Josh. Hi, Josh. How are you? Yep, I'm here. Pretty good today. So who is this creature that we are teasing you about? Uh, the sockeye Alaskan salmon. All righty. All right. What did we say that gave you that answer? Well, when I saw that like the fish was like red. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. When you told like the most of the fish was red. 
I knew that I remember from the show that like I saw like the sockeye salmon. Cool. The whole entire body was red. And I think that was like it becomes red when it's like they're about to die after it lays its eggs. Okay. So that's why I gave it away. All righty. Cool. Uh -huh, cool. That's very cool. Um, I think, and I'm, I was talking to our host, Tim, that like the flamingo, they eat um, the krill, they hang their, uh, their beaks in the water and they eat, and because, and because of the food they eat, they pink. turn pink in color, right? And yeah. I'm thinking the, the sockeyed salmon, part of that is the same reason. Because they eat the krill. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Josh, for calling, and congratulations. Don't forget, every correct response goes into our Homer Hotline Hall of Fame, earn enough points, and you could win a tablet at the end of the season. Tomorrow on Homework Hotline, history teacher Howard Krug will be here with a lesson on the Bill of Rights. Good night. Good night. Production funding for Homework Hotline is provided by New York State United Teachers, working to educate and assist students, provide medical care and support, and strengthen local communities. NYSIC, working for communities across New York State.